to the session on Venus. So Venus is our second planet out, and we're going to compare it to Earth, as well as kind of remember what Mercury was like, and let's see how close Venus is to Mercury. Well, this is probably one of my more favorite pictures of Venus, a nice bright object that out, that's out there in the sky. And it is very noticeable. You, now, let's talk about how you can check and find out where the planets are. Remember that I want you every month to go to skymaps.com and that skymaps.com will allow you to then to go ahead and download an image of what's in the sky for that particular month. And so if you go in there, it will go ahead and have where those planets are. And so if you're lucky enough to have Venus during the time that you're taking this class, Definitely get out there and look at it. It's very easy to find. All you have to basically do is go stand in your backyard or your front yard. Because it, excuse me, it is very recognizable and very easy to find. It will essentially be the brightest thing in the sky there. It's not going to be there very long. Okay, because it's going to be following the sun because it's so close to the sun. But if you've got a chance to view it, definitely go look at it. So, like I said, after the sun and the moon, it is certainly the brightest object in the sky, and so it is very, very, very recognizable. And a lot of times people confuse it, like we've talked about with Mercury, as one of those UFOs that are visiting us. Or the other thing a lot of people will confuse it with is thinking it's a plane, and they'll keep watching it, and it's not moving. Okay, and that's an indication, guys, that you're looking at Venus and not a plane. So Venus is an inferior planet, just like what Mercury was, because it's between us and the Sun. And so therefore, just like Mercury, Venus will also go ahead and go through phases. Now, Venus was named after the Roman goddess of love and beauty. Now, we get most of our names for the planets, as well as the constellations, things like that, named after the Greeks and Romans. But please don't forget that Every other culture that was living at the time of the beginning, looking at what's going on you know, with the, the Chinese and, and the Mayans and the Aztecs and all those, they also had similar names. It's just obviously not the same, but we tended to go ahead and adopt the ones from the Romans and the Greeks. But every culture would have had both a mythology as well as then a naming of the planets that were out there as well as the constellations. I thought you'd enjoy this one because probably when you think about Venus, think about Mars, you think about males, females, and so Venus is that, quote, goddess of love. Look at those two sheep looking at each other. So now Venus came to symbolize the female viewpoint in about 1992. A man by the name of Dr. John Gray published the book, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. And from that time on, you get the Roman god of war, which is what Mars is, and you get Venus, which is the goddess of love. And that tended to look at the male-female stereotypes. And so, like I said, that book offered many suggestions for improving the relationships. You know, is that really working? I'm not going to make any statement relative to that. Just want to kind of remind you where you see men are from Mars and women are from Venus. And so, like I said, they produce that idea that men or women are certainly different from each other as what we see between Venus and Mars, the planets. And you were going to find dramatic differences between those two planets as well. So this is one of the, the front pages of the book. Men are from Mars and women are from Venus. And no, I have not read the book. <laughs> Just have never quite had the time to do that. Just once, I'd like to meet a guy who's not from Mars. It's my form of a little humor there, guys. <laughs> okay, let's go back to Venus. In the early 1900s, well, and actually before 1900s, too, Venus had a whole different configuration on what people thought it looked like. They thought because it was so close to us, called a sister planet around the same size we were, things like that, that it was probably what we were like in terms of the Earth toward the early part of life on the Earth. So it had these very, very, very lush vegetation, had these wonderful forests that had lots and lots and lots of plants in there, probably thought there were dinosaurs and other kinds of creatures that were roaming around. I mean, it was a just kind of take, you know, what we thought the Earth was like at one time with all those really big vegetables and big plants and animals, things like that that were roaming around. And that's kind of what they thought Venus was like. 
very lush. Now you also had some people that thought these things were from Venus. They came from the planet Venus. But ultimately there was still life on Venus and so that was something that was assumed for a long time. It's another one of the many books that came out that looked at the voyage to the planet of prehistoric women. Again, thinking of what was going on with the science fiction of that time and with the planets, because we really didn't know yet. We had not really gotten into that exploration of the planets. And so basically people's imaginations ran wild. That didn't stop, too, because we we're going to talk about what happens when Mars, and the, when Mars invaded the Earth. However, as we found out once we started looking at, Mar or looking at Venus, is that vision was extremely wrong. So let's talk about Venus and what characteristics it does have. We know that it is the, quote, sister planet to the Earth in size. It means it's just a little bit smaller than what the Earth is. It's one of the terrestrial planets, which means it does have the solid surface. Just like Mercury, at times it's seen as a morning star, the other times it's seen as an evening star. And remember, Mercury had one of the highest eccentricities. We'll compare that with Venus having one of the smallest eccentricities. So Venus's orbit is almost a circular orbit, which means that it basically keeps the same average distance from the Sun to Venus consistent throughout the entire year. It's another picture of Venus. Notice how bright it is. Like I said, when it is out, it really stands out. Now the problem when we started looking at Venus is we couldn't see the surface. We found out that Venus is covered by a very, very, very thick atmosphere. And that reflects a tremendous amount of light back. And we can never actually see what was below that top part of the atmosphere of those winds. We know that it appears to be kind of a yellowish white color. And look at that, about 70% of the light that the sun hits Venus gets reflected back into space, which is one of the reasons, again, why it is so bright when we look at it here from the Earth. Okay, that's Venus up at the upper left, and you've got a crescent moon then down toward the bottom right. Now, this is some of the best pictures that we had of Venus for a really long time. You can see there is essentially very, very, very little detail. You've got these massive amounts of clouds. You've also got some pretty hefty winds going on in that atmosphere. This is under different light. So this is not visible light, which is why you're getting the blue color. And they are able to bring out a little bit more detail of that cloud structure. Now this picture is of Venus when it's going through one of its phases, but notice the picture on the left is an x-ray picture of Venus. The one on the right is the optical picture, optical being visible light. X-rays, remember guys, are a little, quite a bit shorter wavelengths of light, more energetic. X-rays are the kinds of things that you would have when you go to the doctor and they need to figure out what's going on inside you, and so they'll take an x-ray. That x-ray goes to the fleshy part of your body, but will be stopped by the bones. But they're more energetic, which means if I look at that picture on the Earth, or excuse me, on the left, then Venus is giving off a tremendous amount of energy in the X-ray part of the spectrum. So it's showing up very well. So exactly what's going on, why is Venus doing that? Now if I think about those clouds that I see on Venus, and you know, let's go back and think about and compare those clouds to the ones that I have here on the Earth. If I'm on top of a mountain and I've got the clouds that are coming down, I can survive a trip through the clouds on Earth. It's not going to kill me. That's not true of what's going on on Venus. Notice the top layer of Venus's clouds are sulfuric acid. Okay, so you do not want to do something like that. You spill sulfuric acid on you, and you're going to have some major, major, major problems because it will start decomposing your skin and everything else that you have on. So it's very, very nasty material. We also know that Venus has some of the densest atmosphere of any of the terrestrial planets, and it's composed mostly of carbon dioxide. Now, think about what our atmosphere is composed of. Most of our atmosphere is nitrogen. And then we've got some oxygen there, and then 1% of everything else. Okay. Mercury, for all essential purposes, did not have an atmosphere other than the particles that retained because of bombardment. But then we get to Venus's atmosphere. It is basically carbon dioxide. It's very, very thick, 
And that's CO2, the same kinds of things that we breathe out. But notice, the pressure on Venus is 92 times that of what's on the Earth. So think about what atmospheric pressure is on the Earth, and now think about somebody pressing down with you with 92 times your weight. Okay? So that's an extremely heavy pressure that we see here on Venus. And that's going to have implications then when we look at the surface of Venus and see what's going on there. You're not going to have any really big, sharp edges. It's not going to happen simply because of the pressure being so high. Like I said, we do know that Venus goes through phases. The only problem is when Venus is in full, we can't see it because we're either looking at the dark side or we're on the wrong side of the sun. So the sun is large enough to go ahead and stop us from seeing Venus when it is on the other side. Now the phases that we usually see that we see usually range from gibbous to crescent and back. And so this kind of shows you those phases that we see. Now as you see the crescent phase, and unfortunately, when it's closest to us is when we have the crescent phase. And in fact, there is a picture of the crescent phase of Venus. Notice you get a nice little thin view right there. Now you can see if this had been the moon, you can see that thin of crescent on the moon if you know when to look and where to look. Okay, when we're talking about Venus, it takes about 243 days to rotate once on its axis. But notice it takes 225 days to revolve around the sun. So it takes longer to rotate on its axis than it does to revolve around the sun. So its day is actually longer than its year. So something's going on there. We also know that the axis of the planet is only tilted about 3 degrees. Again, think about what's going on with the Earth. It's about 24 degrees. Well, both Mercury and Venus have extremely small axes that are tilted, which means, too, if you think about it, knowing how we have seasons on the Earth because of the tilt of our axis, what does that say about the seasons then on looking at Mercury and on Venus? They're not going to really be as prevalent as what they are on the Earth because of that really small tilt of the axis. Now, the other thing is I want you to know is that Venus rotates backwards compared to everybody else which is probably one of the reasons why we have that really discrepancy in terms of looking at how long its year is compared to its day. So what happened there? One of the things that we think might have happened, and again, guys, this is only a hypothesis. We're not really sure. We think that Mercury, excuse me, Venus might have been hit by something in the early times when the solar system was forming because we know there was a lot of material that was roaming around during that time. And some of that material that was still roaming was pretty big. And so if it ran into Venus, it could have been enough to completely cause Venus to have shifted and completely then turned around and is slowly going ahead and turning back around to match everybody else's direction of rotation. Or maybe there are tidal effects or maybe there's something else that we're not aware of. So there is still, as I said with Mercury, lots and lots of mysteries out there within our solar system. And so we're trying to figure those things out. And the best way then to go ahead and answer them is to send something to Venus to get a feel for what it's like. So that's what we've done. Now, are you one of those people that on the back of your car, on your bumper sticker, has all kinds of bumper stickers showing where you've been? So let's talk about the probes that have gone to Venus. Certainly the Mariners did. Remember that Mariner 10 was one of them that had gone ahead and photographed Mercury? Well, we've got the same thing. When a lot of the Mariners were out there in the early 1960s, what it did was went by Venus. In some cases, it settled in orbit. And so it was looking at the atmosphere, because that's basically the only thing you could see at that point. Then Pioneer Venus in the 1970s, dropped probes through the atmosphere, and fortunately, none of them did indeed reach the surface. Now, I want you to think about this surface. We know that it's extremely high pressures. We know that it's made up, at least the top part of it is made up of sulfuric acid, very nasty in the place. We're going to find out that it's extremely high temperatures, and so putting all those things together, unfortunately, none of the Pioneer Venus probes made it to the surface. That's not true, though, of some of the probes that were sent out from other countries. The Venera 7 probe is certainly one of them that did make it to the surface of Venus. This was done between 1961 and 1981, and like I said, that did make it to the surface. And then we've had Magellan that was sent out in 1989. 
What it tried to do was look at the surface using radar because we wanted a way to be able to see through those clouds to be able to get a good feel for what then the surface looked like. This is a radar map of Venus. Again, guys, false color. We don't see that color on there. But it gives you a feel for what are the highlands and what are the lowlands. Okay, the highlands are the areas that are in pink. So you can see some at the very top as well as some over on the right side. Then those really deep blues give you a feel for the lowlands. And the deeper the blue is, then the lower the land mass is. Then Cassini and Galileo went by as they were heading out to Jupiter and Saturn. That was in the early 1990s. Messenger, as I said, when it finally settled down on Mercury, it had gone by Venus a couple of times to use that gravity assist to get to Mercury. And then in 2005, the United States sent up the Venus Express, and it is in orbit right now around Venus. And so it's just studying general characteristics and behaviors then of Venus. And this is taken of Venus as it's getting closer and closer and closer to that outer layer of those clouds. So you're really there, guys. So, like I said, it is assumed because Venus is a terrestrial planet, because it's just a little bit smaller than what the Earth is, is it the, is the fact that it has then the same internal structure of the Earth. It has that crust, that mantle, and that core. The core is thought to be partially liquid, but there doesn't seem to be any evidence of a magnetic field. And so is it partially liquid and we just don't have enough of that evidence of a magnetic field? Is it so small we can't go ahead and recognize it? Is it there because of the really slow rotation of the planet? We're not really sure what's going on yet. Now if you think about what the surface of Venus looks like, and remember, we have not seen the surface of Venus in visible light, with the exception of one of the pictures I'm going to show you here in just a few minutes. The only way that we've seen that surface is based on the radar maps of it. But it looks like that the surface of Venus is very much like the Earth would be if it didn't have that constant weathering and erosion going on. There are very, very low winds at the surface and does not seem to be any presence of ice or water now, although it is thought that in the past it certainly was there. Venera 7 was launched by the Soviet Union, and it did survive the trip down to the surface. And so that's why we have a feel of what the surface looks like. It's just a very limited amount because Venera 7 was not able to get very much before it was destroyed. But we do have some pictures of the surface. Venera 7 lasted about 53 minutes before it went ahead and was basically destroyed. And 13 out of the 16 probes survived the trip down to the surface, but they didn't survive it very long. Now this is a picture from Venera 7 of the surface of Venus. And this is one of the very small number of pictures that we actually have. In fact, you can see the probe itself down there in the lower right, and you can see one of the pieces that is coming off the probe that was destroyed during that flight down. But notice how flat that surface is. You don't see any kind of rock sticking up. Well, you've got that temperature is about 900 degrees Fahrenheit. I mean, you're temperatures are hot enough to go ahead and basically melt anything there. And on top of those really hot temperatures, which is making a lot of things molten, then you've also got those really high pressures. So we didn't really expect to see any real high peaks on uh, Venus relative to the rocks, things like that. And that's certainly true. It doesn't seem to be very flat. Think of slabs as opposed to really those rocks. Lots of slab on Venus. Surface consists of about 80% lowlands, which are basically lava plains, and they resemble kind of what we would expect of a salt ocean lava basins to look like here on the Earth. So look at the ocean, take away the ocean itself, and what you have left then is those plains that are at the bottom of the ocean, and that's what a lot of the surface of Venus is. We also know that we see crustal plate spreading, excuse me, that there are a result of widespread lava flows, but we don't have any of that crustal plate movement. So we don't see plate tectonics here on Venus like that we do here on the Earth. So think about what the Earth would be like if we didn't have those plates that were moving. This is just another picture of the surface of Venus, again taken with radar. 
In this case, the lighter colored areas are the higher areas, and then you get those darker areas that are in the lowlands. Now, if you're really sharp-eyed, you can see that this picture here is basically a flipped picture of the one that I showed you before, because that little white area at the bottom on that picture earlier was at the top. And so you're taking these pictures as you've got the Magellan that is going around Venus. Now these are pictures looking at some of the volcanoes on Venus. And you can definitely see that they look like there have been lava flows. Are they active right now? We're not sure. Okay. We certainly know they have been active in the past. Now because the pressure and temperatures are so high, Venus is more like this really, really, really low gentle rolling hills all over the surface. Okay, and hills are probably even the wrong word to really use. Almost like little, little mounds that are over there. They're very flat, very gentle rolling because of the really high pressures and high temperatures. Simply never had a chance to get very tall. So, how come we don't have any crustal plate movement? Because there is definitely a great deal of heat because we do see evidence of magma flowing. Well, there is a, one hypothesis that says a crust is basically too strong. You know, you got too much temperature, you got too much pressure there. You can't get those things to go ahead and break through. We don't have the presence of water, so therefore you certainly don't have any kind of plate movement because of the oceans, things like that. Okay? So that might be one idea on why you definitely don't have any plate uh, movement. Some evidence goes ahead and supports the fact that Venus underwent massive global restructuring as late as about 500 million years ago, so something went on with that surface there. And then you had a decrease in the number of active volcanoes. So, you know, again, we're not really sure geologically what happened on Venus, but there is some indication that something happened about that time. So, was that something that maybe was going on within the mantle itself, and you for some reason had more heat that was produced within that mantle, which then caused the crust to go ahead and collapse? You know, unfortunately, it had been great to have cameras back then to be able to see what was going on, but we just don't. All we have is the ability to look at what we currently see on Venus today and to hypothesize then what happened back, you know, 500 million years ago and beyond. In addition to all the plains that you see on Venus, there are several individual mountains, two continents, and several mountain ranges. The two continents are Ishtar and Aphrodite. Now remember guys, we're talking about Venus, which is named after the goddess of love. So basically everything on Venus, with very rare exceptions, is named after women. There are maximal mountains, which are not named after women, there are a couple of other ones, but basically everything that you're gonna see on Venus that has a name is named after a woman. Surface of Venus shows show few craters that are less than 10 kilometers in diameter. You know, but now if we think about why that's probably true, I mean realize we've got an extremely strong or thick atmosphere on Venus. And so a lot of those smaller projectiles simply are never going to make it down to the surface. They're either going to burn up, they're going to be destroyed, they're going to be basically broken apart. They're never actually going to make it down there. Or if they do make it down there, because of the pressures and temperatures, essentially they're just going to go ahead and you're not going to tell that they actually hit the surface. Now we do see large craters with distorted sides, distorted sides, excuse me guys, that are visible across the surface. And that makes sense. I mean, you're talking about really large projectiles that come in. They manage to make it through that atmosphere, but probably not coming straight down because of the atmosphere they came in more at an angle or if they started straight down still hit them at an angle and so that's why you get those distorted sides because they probably either didn't make it quite down straight they could have broken up a variety of things before they actually hit. Now there are only about 15% of the expected craters visible on the surface. And again, that makes sense because you're probably having a lot of geological activity going on because of those high temperatures and those pressures and the fact that you still do have volcanoes that are active and so whatever happens on there isn't gonna stay around very long. But it's not due to the weathering and the erosion that we see here on the Earth. 
So we have to think about the different mechanisms that would be going on within those various planets to account for why we're seeing the planets the way they are. So remember, guys, we assume that the planets all started out essentially equal. Okay? And then based on where they are in the solar system, their mass, their composition, all those kinds of things then provide what we see today on the surface. Volcanism is probably the primary mechanism of the surface renewal because we do know volcanoes are present in great numbers. We do know that there's a tremendous amount of energy being created in the mantle that's breaking through then with the crust and being able to see those lava flows on the surface. There aren't any plate tectonics, so that crust doesn't move around. And so if you think about it, if I've got, let's say, an area that has a volcano directly over a hot spot, and that hot spot just continues to produce lava, well, then you can get some massive growth on these volcanoes or mountains okay, because of the fact that they're not going anyplace. Think about the Hawaiian chains. Those volcanoes continue to keep moving. Okay? So they don't have a chance to really get really tall. Well, if you don't have any crustal plate movement, that material just keeps welling up. And so you get these massive volcanoes, not so much in height, because we're going to find out the uh, volcanoes on Mars are a little bit taller, but these volcanoes tend to be massive in terms of the amount of volume. So we've got convection currents that are bringing that magma to the surface, same thing that we have here on the Earth. That surface gets stretched and pulled just like we see what's here on the Earth. And so just like the Earth, you get these ridges and these cliffs and these mountains, all those kinds of things. Well, that's what we see then on Venus, and we think that those then, those mountains, are formed that way because of the continual stretching and pushing of the surface together. Now, remember, guys, it's not because you have two plates that are running into each other. The surface itself, okay, not the crustal plates, just the surface, is being stretched and pulled and folded. Just some examples of old lava flows on Venus. Remember I said that Venus has some of the largest volcanoes by volume. Okay, just the center portion of the caldera of this volcano is 40 kilometers across, and we have individual lava flows of 500 kilometers long or more. This is probably one of the more famous ones. This happens to be the one that's photographed more, simply because of the way that we have taken those pictures. You can kind of see the lava flow coming out on the sides. Now, the other thing's massive, guys simply because of the fact that it's not moving. And so everything that comes up from below continues to come up and just go ahead then and build that volcano over a period of time. Now, we also have seen things called pancake domes or pancake, what appeared to be flat structures that we think are from the same reason, that lava, but it never quite makes it to the surface, but it does get up to the crust, and then the crust starts spreading out, and so you get things that start bulging. Now, I said, think Yellowstone National Park. Remember when we talked about the Earth? I said that Yellowstone National Park seems to have a magma chamber that's rising, that's making the lake at Yellowstone National Park go ahead and move up or expose more of the shore on one side. Well, that's the same thing that we see happening on Venus. And it's kind of nice because that means the same things that we observe on the Earth seem to have the same mechanisms that we're observing on Venus. You just take into account for the differences between the planets and things then seem to be working out the same. And so here's one of those lava domes that kind of form a pancake. Also notice on this picture and the next picture I'm going to show you, you can see what appears to be old lava forms or areas that have been pushed out and wrinkled. That's what those uh, areas are to the uh, center and to the right then. So that magma just simply didn't make it up in the form of a volcano, but it did push it up far enough that the surface itself started to show some bulging. This one is real obvious when you're looking at uh, how that material is coming up from below. Like I said, if the magma reaches the surface, then you're going to have these pancake volcanoes form. And they go ahead and look something what I just showed you relative to the domes, only now you do have lava that has come out and spread out on the top there. 
So let's talk about the surface conditions. As I said, it's not really that wonderful place that people originally thought it was going to be, with those luscious forests and those dinosaurs and birds roaming around. I don't think so, guys. Temperatures are great enough to melt lead and zinc. And like I said, as we've talked, the atmosphere exerts a pressure 92 times that of the Earth. And on top of the fact, you got a lot of sulfur dioxide, so it's going to smell really bad. So Venus is not a nice place to go. Now, this is not a picture of Venus. This is a picture on the Earth, but it kind of reminds me of what I think Venus might be like. And keep in mind, guys, this is not an actual picture of Venus. Okay? But it's one that I've added because it reminds me of what I think Venus might be like. Very nasty place, not a nice place you want to go take a nice summer vacation. This, however, is a picture of Venus. And you're getting one of those pancake lavas. So you can see that it kind of started out really flat and the lava broke through and then it just kind of spread out to the sides. Notice as you're looking up in the back how flat that area is. Another picture of Venus where you can start seeing some of the volcanoes in the back. Remember I said that Venus has an extremely thick atmosphere. About 96% of it is carbon dioxide. Only 4% of it is nitrogen. Remember our atmosphere is about 80% nitrogen. And then there's everything else. And that everything else includes sulfuric acid, uh, sulfur dioxide, you know, so as I said earlier, it's going to smell really badly. Think of rotten eggs. It's not one of those smells you really like. There's also evidence of some snow on Venus. Okay, now, snow, notice that I put in parentheses there, guys. It's not snow as in the kinds of snow that we have. It's snow that's probably looking at some kind of elemental, either lead sulfide or something like that. And so the best example I can give you when it's snowing is think about falling rock pieces. I mean, that's Mercury, or Venus's version of snow. Which again, is probably not a good thing to be out when it's doing that. Now on Earth, we know that a lot of the CO2 is tied up in the rocks and the sediments. On Venus, however, it's not going to happen because those temperatures are so high that it tends to come out of solution, basically. So it's not in the rocks anymore came out of the rocks, it's now in the atmosphere, and that's one of the reasons why the atmosphere is so thick on Venus. And we're going to talk about a runaway greenhouse effect and what it does with temperature because we worry about that here on the Earth. Well, we think that the reason that um, Venus is so hot is because of that greenhouse effect. So I want you to think about your car on a nice hot summer day. You have the windows rolled up and you have a black interior. Okay. So you come out, you open the car door up, and immediately you're hit with this wave of heat coming out. Well, where did that heat come from? Because it's certainly not that hot outside. Well, go back and think about what was going on with your car. You had the windows rolled up. Now, if I'm sitting in my car, I can certainly look out the windows. Okay. If I'm outside the car, I can look in. So I know that the windows are transparent to visible light, okay. the light that we see it with. But there's also light out there in the atmosphere that is in the form of ultraviolet energy, which is a little bit more energetic than what visible light is. Well, that ultraviolet light ends up going through the window, and in the process of going through the window, it's going to lose energy. It's going to go from a higher, excuse me, a shorter wavelength to a longer wavelength. Well, that longer wavelength is seen in the form of infrared radiation. Infrared radiation is nothing more than heat. So what happens is you have the visible light that goes in and out, but you have then the ultraviolet light comes in through the window and the process it loses energy and gets turned into infrared and infrared then gets trapped because the windows are not transparent to the infrared radiation. So basically heat builds up in the car. And so then when you come in, open that door, you know, all this massive amount of heat comes out. I don't know, if you sit there and you've got a black steering wheel and you sit in the car and you try and touch that black steering wheel, my guess is you're not going to be able to hold on to it for a while because more UV light coming through those windows, the more heat that builds up, and since it can't go any place, the temperatures inside the car just get hotter and hotter and hotter. Well, guys, that's exactly what's going on with Venus, only what's playing the role of the window is Venus's clouds, that surface, excuse me, that atmosphere of Venus. And so the UV light comes through the atmosphere of Venus. It gets converted through that process into infrared. 
that heat then is get trapped and it can't get back out. And so the temperatures on Venus then keep getting hotter and hotter and hotter. Now, not only do you have it really hot then on Venus, which is why you have temperatures that are approaching 900 degrees Fahrenheit, you also have winds at the top part of the atmosphere. And they are extremely strong. Now, both Venera 11 and Venera 12 detected a constant stream of lightning. And in fact, Venera 12 recorded a clap of thunder. So we do know we have thunder and lightning, but not raining liquid water. Okay? But you still have that friction that builds up where you get that lightning and, and the same kinds of mechanisms that you have here on the Earth that are producing it. It's just not producing it with liquid water. Again, an artist's conception, guys. This is not an actual picture. But that gives you a feel for what it might look like in the atmosphere of Venus. Again, an artist's conception, not an actual picture. This, however, is an actual picture. This is from Magellan that's in orbit around Venus right now. And one of the reasons that Magellan is there is to study the atmosphere of Venus. Now, this is a still shot. The one on the left shows you what that atmosphere looks like during the day. The one on the right is at night. So now let me run this one. And if you look at it very carefully, you can see some of the rotation. Now, it slowed down considerably. But you can see the rotational effects of the wind on the bottom, which is during the daylight. And then you can see what's happening then during the evening. So we know those winds are extremely strong. So why are they there? Why are they as strong as what they are? It's one of the questions we hope Magellan will be able to answer. Now you go all the way down to the surface, however, and they are extremely low. And basically, the weather is very calm and consistent throughout the year. Now, one of the reasons it's very consistent is because essentially you have the same season all year round. Because remember that tilt of that axis? OK, very, very small. So very calm, very consistent all the way throughout the year. So if you can make it at least in terms of the winds through the top part of the atmosphere, you're OK once you get to the surface. It's everything else that's going to get you once you get to the surface. Now, we do have two continents, Ishtar and Aphrodite. Ishtar is about the size of Australia, and it's the one that's found up in the northern highlands. And it's the one that contains the Maxwell Mountains. And the Maxwell Mountains then rise about seven miles above the surface of Ishtar. So those things are really high above the atmosphere. And so if I look at that little white spot right at the top part of the screen, well, that's the Maxwell Mountains. And then that pink area then is looking at the continent. And so those mountains are sitting right on top of the continent. Remember, that's about the size of Australia. Just another picture looking more down directly onto the top part or the pole area of Venus. And so you see the Maxwell Mountains again right there. They're very distinct. And Aphrodite is a larger of the two, and it's about the size of, or excuse me, of Africa. And it stretches along the equator about a third of the way around. And so this is a picture of that continent. And you can see that it's much more elongated. And it spreads, like I said, around a third of the way around the planet itself. Remember, that's the light areas, because light indicates Height, whereas a dark area indicates looking down into the lower areas on the planet. Now, I've got two websites, which I'm going to let you go ahead and watch. I'm not going to worry about pulling them up right now. And the reason I say that I want you to watch them instead of you showing them here, because these are both of trenches that are in the Atlantic Ocean that are those hot black smokers. And the reason that I wanted you to look at this is because at one time we didn't think that there was any way that when you had the very bottom of the ocean with those really deep trenches where you had magma that was coming up to the surface at the bottom of the ocean, that you could actually have life. And so both of these then show those black smokers. And they talk about looking at the life that you see there. And you'll see these big tube worms, all those kinds of things. Not that I think that we would ever have a chance right now to be able to find life on Venus. But it's certainly the possibilities, even though you have those temperatures that are extremely high and those pressures that are extremely large. So you always think about the possibilities and what might exist out there. So guys, take a look at these two videos. They're on YouTube. They're sailing with them so that you do have somebody talking about them. And 
we're looking at a water environment, so I understand that that's different, but just the possibilities of the life that they had found at the bottom of that ocean, there was something that we totally did not expect could exist. And so it always brings out those possibilities of what's going on out there. So with that, guys, next time we'll come in, we'll start talking about Mars and start heading out of the outer parts of the solar system. So with that, talk to you later.